Lila Moy, where are you from? Oh, Lila Moy. Dandavat Maharaj. I'm from Brazil. Oh, you're from Brazil. <coughs> Toto bon? <laughs> Tudo bem. Tudo bem. Okay. Uh, which city in Brazil? Uberlândia. Uberlândia. Okay. Não falo português. He here we have a... Uh... We have a senior devotee called Sri Hari Prabhu. I think you know him, right? Uh, I don't know. Sri Hari. In which city? Oh, Uberlandia. Okay. No, I don't. Uberlandia. Here, yeah. Uberlandia. Yes. Okay. No, follow Portuguese, follow Espanol. I don't... Hey, Gora Chandra. Bandava Maharaj, how are you? I'm, I'm good, how about you? Good, happy to see you. There is always this lady follow me around. I don't know who she is. Rasa Raj. Bandava Maharaj, Bandava Devotees. Devashish, Ishanuga, Dandava, Krishna Mohini, Krishna Chaitanya in Ukraine. Saraswati, you're in London, you're in the temple or no? Dandava Maharaj, yes, I'm at the temple. Oh. Isolating in one room. Uh, maybe you'll come. I heard you got you got COVID a second you got COVID a second time, huh? Yes, uh, I am collecting all the uh, antibodies possible. Oh, I, I thought you meant you're collecting all the different kinds of COVID. <laughs> yes, this is a second type. Pero es es peor or or. Or menos que la primera. It's it's less. Uh, it's 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 like a flu. Okay, and the first time it wasn't like a flu. No, it was more severe. No. Oh, so you're getting lots of antibodies. Mm-hmm. Krishna Mohini. Then what? Danda, Maharaj, Danda, para todos los devotos, Danda. Krishna Mohini, ¿tú has tenido COVID también? Krishna Mohini, ¿have you ever had COVID? Sí, Maharaj, lo tengo ahorita. Oh, ok. Maharaj, tengo, tengo COVID ahora, ahora, esta semana. Ok. La baña moís there too, in the kitchen. People want COVID now because it's Omicron, so by saying Omicron, they get some rasa boss. Maybe for saying Om, Om Nikrom. Hello. Did anyone say that part from you? Did anyone that noticed that? What? 
You're the only one that I know that noticed that. Oh, man. I wonder if tending Om gives you uh, Rasa Boss. Yes, Maharaj. <laughs> Well, if you say if you say Bola Rama, you get Rasa Bas, but do you get Rasa Bas by saying Omicron? Omicron. It's Omicron, right? Om there. You got that name because it was spread by Omnis. Anyway, here we are, back on a Wednesday. What what were you saying, Lavanya Moyi? I couldn't understand. I was saying that I hadn't heard anyone else point out the fact that there was an Om in Omnicrom apart from you. You're the first <coughs> pointed that out. How could you not? How could anyone not notice that? I don't know. It's Omicron, right? O M I. Is that how you spell it? I think so. Well, it has O M right in the front, right? Yeah. But does saying Om count as Rasa Bas? I know if you say. You mean Nama Bas? Yeah, Nama Bas. But you only get Nama bus is only for people who are a little um, not making any uh, Nama, not making Nama Paras. Well, so it had to be connected with the previous Sukriti. Yeah. Devashis, do you get? Did you get any more questions from uh, from anonymous? No, no, I haven't. Every every week, less and less people are coming. They're all in bed with uh, COVID. with COVID. Really. Is that okay? Then well. Kind of interesting that, you know, here in the modern age, good old fashioned plagues haven't died away. <laughs> yes, it's good to know some of the old values are still with us. Yeah, I was thinking that maybe we, somebody could get a job driving a, a cart pulled by a horse <clears throat> and throw the, throw the bodies on the back like they used to do. Like in the good old days. Yeah. Uh. So does anyone have any questions? How's, what's been happening over there, Marge? Anything? The devotees? What? What's been happening there? Anything happening at the temple, the devotees? Well, yeah, we had we had nice celebrations for Srila Govinda Maharaj's divine appearance. That was nice, really good. And actually, there have been a lot of there were a lot of celebrations in the last couple of weeks, and then. We had some shraddhas, incidentally, two of the two of the three people who the shraddha was for had died of had died of COVID, but we did have a nice shraddha for them. As Jai Ram's Jai Ram's uh, wife Saba, her her mother and her brother, and then Jairam's father, but his father didn't, his father just died of natural causes. He was old. Uh, 
and things are going on. When you do the shraddha, do you do the whole, do you put the table and you call the soul or you just do the Vaishnava uh, festival? Or you, you make a table and you call the soul and you offer them the... Yeah, I, I would, for me, the most important part is the, is the Vaishnava Seva feeding the devotees, but we did have the table with the pictures and the family members sitting there and... But no, Simply we, because we, they're, they're uh -huh. right up, are they actually Hindus, the, the family, uh, Indian? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah they're... They're from Delhi. And and uh, Jai Ram's father in law, that's Abba's father, is very he himself took initiation from Acharya Maharaj. And he was a very very nice man. He was an astrologer and he was also a pandit. And uh, he used to he used to help the help the devotees. He used to buy buy cloth and crowns and things like that for the deities that he would send. Very nice man. Abba's brother wasn't so old. I mean, obviously, if it's her brother, he's not old. Maharaj, I have a question. Uh -huh. I, uh, I finished the, the Chaitanya Bhagavad and at the very end, there is the introduction of uh, Rupa and Sanatan uh, when there were Muslim officers to, um, to Mahaprabhu and, then, and how they became Vaishnavas and everything. But, Sometimes I have heard uh, more about them, uh, about how they went from 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 Puri to Brindavana and they stay there. And I I know that part is on the on the Chaitanya uh, Charitamrita, but I was wondering if there is any more um, literature about Rupa and Sanatana that we could read uh, uh, to learn more about them, if you know about this, of course. What to learn more biographical information about them, or to learn more about their writings? Uh, both. Well, well, their writings, of course, of course, of course, their writing, but also biographical. I am, I, I am very keen on on, on biographies. Yes. Uh huh. I don't know, but I'm just, I just would like to learn more about them both. I think it's very interesting that all their life. No. Mostly what I know about them I, is from what I've read in Chaitanya Charitamrita, and from what I've heard from Guru Maharsh and Govinda Maharsh, like that, Prabhupada. Apparently the relationship with, between Rupa Go between Sanatan Goswami, Sanatan Goswami and the, the Muslim, Muslim Nawab, it was, seems to have been very close because the, the Nawab says, your elder brother is busy attacking he, what do you say? He's busy fighting, and he required. He said he required the help of Rupa Goswami to run the run the state. And he says, the Nawab says, your elder brother. Now we know that Rupa Sanatan and Sri Balaba or Anupama that Sanatan is the eldest brother. So if the Nawab says to him, your elder brother, obviously it's a reference to himself. And he's referring to himself as the elder brother of 
Sanatana Goswami, so one has the idea that the relationship between them was very intimate, that they were close. And that, as he also says, he was relying on Sanatana Goswami to run the estate, run the estate while he was conquering, while he was, you know, going to, he said, he said he was going to Orissa. He was going to Orissa and then Sanatana Goswami says, then I can't help you if you're going to, if you're going to declare, if you're going to declare, if you're going to fight against the Lord himself. Now, we don't, by that reference, I don't know if, if the Nawab is referring to, uh, no, it's, it's Sanatan Goswami who says, I can't help you because you're giving trouble to the Lord. Now, I would believe that he would be referring to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who was in Puri, but it could also be a reference to um, Lord Jagannath. But anyway, um, Sanatana Goswami replies in that way that he won't help him. And apparently, in the past, the Nawab had been completely dependent on Sanatana Goswami to keep the whole, to keep all of Bengal and everything, to keep that, so to speak, afloat, so that it, that things would continue. But now Sanatana Goswami says, "Don't count on me any longer. I'm I'm leaving this service." And then the Nawab tried to argue with him, and then when he saw that he wasn't getting anywhere with Sanatana Goswami, then he had him put in jail, had him imprisoned. But we see that Rupa Goswami... Of course, yes. I forgot, sorry. And then Rupa Goswami, he knew, he knew instinctively there was going to be problems. So he left money with the, with the local grocer, so groceries. That would be, I don't know if they have the word in, in uh, Venezuela, but in Mexico they call it abarrotes. You have that word? Abarrotes. Yes, we say something in Calle. Yes. Okay, so that means somebody who's selling vegetables, right? A grocer. I mean, grocer is selling what the what people want to buy: rice, doll, vegetables, all those things. And that apparently they didn't. Obviously, they didn't have banks. But you have to. You have to. Uh, You have to tip your tip your hat to that that they didn't have banks; they used grocers instead of bankers. So then, Rupa Goswami left ten thousand gold coins with a grocer to get Sanatan Goswami out of jail. And apparently, that's a tremendous amount of money. Because we hear later that once Sanatan's out of jail, an astrologer tells a local, you know, Hindu landlord or something, tells him, this man has great riches with him. He has, has eight, gold, eight gold coins or eight, eight of these sovereigns or however they're called. And, and he, and the, Landlord was going to kill him for those eight, was going to kill Sanatana Goswami for those eight gold coins. And compare that with how much was offered to the jailkeeper, Muslim jailkeeper, to get Sanatana Goswami out of, out of jail. He offered him first 
5,000 gold coins. Compare that to seven. Seven was the, eight, no, pardon me, eight. Eight was the number that could have gotten Sanatana Goswami killed by a local landlord who was crossing his land. Apparently eight gold coins is so much money. And yet compare, that compared to 10,000 gold coins, which, which Sanatana Goswami had from a grocer, to get him out of jail. I mean, that's like eight coins times, you know, like times like, what, 12,500? That many, that many times, that many times, see, uh, no, not 12,000. He had 10,000 gold coins and it was, yes, it was eight times, 12.5 12. 12. times would be 12.5 times, um, what is it? Uh, 1,250 1, times more gold coins than those eight, which, was, which would be an incredible amount of money. Then when the jailer saw that many gold coins, at first he was afraid. He was afraid that he was afraid that uh, the Nawab would be very angry with the jailkeeper if he if he helped let Sanat and Goswami get released from jail. But apparently the sight of to so many gold coins stacked up. He could not resist that. But then Sanatana Goswami gave him a plausible excuse. He said, well, you can just tell that when he went to bathe in the Ganga, he, he somehow or other got carried away in the Ganga. Well, the Ganga carried him away and we, can't, we could not even find him. That's what... Sanatana Goswami offered as an excuse that the jailkeeper could say. Whether that would be very convincing or not is not is not a question because the jailkeeper became so greedy after the gold coins that he was w willing to take any risk. I mean, 10,000 gold coins that would convert you in being a rich person, very rich person, right? Anyway, we hear those things. As far as more information about Rup Sanat, and I'm sure, I'm sure in other literatures, those things are discussed, but I'm not familiar with that literature. In fact, today I just finished, what was it? Uh, I guess the third chapter of Ancha Leela. And you finished the whole Chaitanya Bhagavat, right? Yeah, I read the Chaitanya Bhagavat previously, but I don't, how much, I'll have to see what more information is there against about Rupa and Sanatan. Well, you have an amazing power of uh, uh, remembering the details and the amounts, uh, like the eight gold coins. Like that, to me, is really impressive. I don't have that memory. Well, I wish. It, the, it's kind of strange for me because because they're always saying in school they always said people who are fast readers they have higher retention. They say fast readers remember more. But I'm not a fast reader. I'm a slow reader. But but when I but when I read, I kind of like read very deeply. So I don't know what to think. Did you ever hear that? Anyone ever hear that? People who can are speed readers, they have higher retention, they say. But I'm the opposite of a speed reader.
No, I have read that. I have read that the speed readers usually they get like a like the gist of whatever they are reading, but not like you. You really can remember very fine details. I don't think that you get that by speed reading. Yeah, but also you have to consider that I've been reading the Chaitanya Charitamrita for I don't know maybe in the morning, maybe for thirty years, and I've we've read read over the whole Chaitanya Charitamrita probably 40 or 50 times. You know, because when I finished, I just now I'm reading, I've read the Chaitanya Bhagwat and I read it with the verses, but now I'm reading the, the prose edition, which Govindamars liked or spoke about when he said, when he referred to the edition by Bhakti by Bob Puri Marsh, although Govinda Marsh thought it was by Bhakti by Bob Puri Marsh because some of the people with him just published actually Sarva Bhavana Das's um, Chaitanya Bhagwat and put Puri Marsh's name on it because they they like referenced or they ha included three or four of his purports that he'd given three or four lectures. He'd spoken something about the Chaitanya Bhagwat and lectures. They included that when they, but the whole book that they printed was not by Puri Marsh. It was by Sarva Bhavana. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm reading now. Now, previously I read the one with the, the Bengali verses and the commentaries of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Well, I have seven more verses in the Chaitanya Bhagavad, and there's a little bit of difference because the Chaitanya Bhagavad has ten. Every other chapter is more or less the same as the Chaitanya Charitamrita, but the Chaitanya Bhagavad, Antya, Antya Skanda, is ten chapters, and in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's twenty chapters, and that's because. That's because uh, Srila Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, he gave more emphasis to Mahaprabhu Sanyas Leela than Vrindavan Das Thakur gave. But today I was reading in the third chapter about Vidya Vachaspati and how when Mahaprabhu went there to his house, uh, like it describes in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it says Mahaprabhu went to Vijayavachaspati's house and there were so many people coming to see him that they damaged the roads because they were scooping up earth where, where Mahaprabhu walked and it was making holes in the road. And Guru Maharaj and his, Guru Maharaj and his uh, golden volcano of divine love, he talks he talks about that of Vijayavachaspati. What is the verse that he refers to when he mentions Bhakti Vinod Thakur? I believe, I believe that when I first read that, that it, I thought it said that, um, that Bhakti Vinod Thakur was like looking down from the roof of the house of Vidyavachaspati, but now I believe I'm mistaken. I was mistaken about that because who went to the roof of the house of Vidyavachaspati was Mahaprabhu. Mahaprabhu went to his, the roof. So then what Bhakti Vinod Thakur is describing, I believe, is looking up at Mahaprabhu on the, on the rooftop. Devashis, do you know about that? No sound. Yeah, sorry, Marge. No, I'm not really um, very uh, aware of that. Well, you know, there in the in the Golden Volcano, there's a picture. There's a picture, and it talks in the picture. The the, the underneath the picture, it describes that. I'd like to get the book just to see because I. Because today I'm reading and it's Mahaprabhu's on the roof. 
And I would believe that what Bhakti Vinod Thakur is describing is looking up at Mahaprabhu on the roof. So I'm going to just let that Chaitanya. This is the wonderful town. Quickly, I didn't see it in English, but I have the Spanish one, so I'm looking here because I remember having that picture. It's from the chapter uh, uh, A Tragedy of Separation. There's a picture there. I think this is one of my. This book is so incredible, this, this golden volcano. Yeah, it says, here's a picture of Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, and it says, Spanish, he visualized it himself looking at Ma Prabhu on the on the roof and expressing oh, yeah. the desire in his in his heart. When will when will that day come when Nimai Pandit takes off his sannyas clothes and become and again becomes one of one with us uh, or Again, regrese otra vez a unirse con nosotros. Again, joins with us in Kirtan, in the house of Srivas. So, so it's, it goes along with the idea that the devotees, they don't really like to, in our temples, you won't see, you won't see pictures of Mahaprabhu as a sannyasi. You don't just generally you just don't see pictures of Mount Prabhu with his head shaved. Just like Nityananda Prabhu didn't like that Mahaprabhu was carrying around the Dunda and he broke it and threw it in the river. And then Mahaprabhu didn't accept anything of Nityananda Prabhu's explanation. What happened to my Dunda? Oh, you were, we, you were dancing and, and we fell in ecstasy or something and <laughs> fell on the Dunda and it broke in pieces. Like that. Mahaprabhu wasn't. <laughs> Mahaprabhu wasn't buying that story, so to speak. That, that they fell, fell on the Dunda and the weight of their of them falling on the Dunda broke it. And then then how Mahaprabhu expresses himself is interesting because more or less says, I didn't have any possessions, just that Dunda, and now you've broken my Dunda, and he's 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 pretty upset about it. Which what, what Nityananda could have said is, Dandavat, Dandavat Ananda Govinda. Nityananda could have said, well, it was the neck of Danda. Mayavadis carry that around. So we broke it in three pieces, and now it's a tree Danda. <laughs> but apparently, he wasn't waiting for any explanation. He just immediately, after it broke it, he threw it in the river. But like I said, I've read the Chaitanya Charitamrita over and over and over again. So it's not like I just read it once and I remember these things as I, you know.
Hmm. Now, I also <coughs> heard Srila Guru Maharaj, he said, and I, I believe it's very important to read the Srimad Bhagavatam. But, but Srila Guru Maharaj said, Devashish, are you well? Uh, Maharaj, I also have the COVID, but coming to the end of it, thankfully, hopefully. Uh, I wonder if I have if I've ever had COVID because I'm because I'm always sleepy. <laughs> That's uh, one of the um, symptoms. Uh, but I never had any fever. So, Srila Guru Mar Srila Govinda Maharaj, was it Guru Maharaj or Govinda Maharaj who said, yes, you can read the Srimad Bhagavatam, but you have to read every verse and all the commentaries from the first, first verse to the last verse of the stream of the 12th canto. You heard that comment? Yeah, I've heard that, yeah. <clears throat> Well, I don't remember how many verses there are in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, what is it? There's 10,000 verses, is that it? Or something like that. And then in the Srimad Bhagavatam, there's like 30,000 verses or something. The Mahabharat, 100,000 verses. I don't remember all the numbers, but I know if you're going to be reading all the verses of the Srimad Bhagavatam and all the purports, well, you can see how voluminous it is. It takes up a lot of space, right? Yeah. I think you would, you would obviously, if you were reading, say, 50 to 100 verses every day, it would seem like you would be reading for about For a year or something to finish it. Nice. And if you're reading all the commentaries as well, you'd be reading all day. Not just all day, all year. Yeah. I mean, all day, every day. Yeah. Yeah. Which is no bad thing, I'm sure. No, it's not a bad thing. Would be good. When I read the Chaitanya Charitamrita, I'm generally reading just the verses. But some people have expressed their disdain for that, saying, you know, why why don't you read the purports? But I don't know. I read the purports generally when there's when when I find there's something I need to read in order to understand what's happening. But a lot of times there's, there is long purports and I'm sure they're very good, but have you read the whole Srimad Bhagavatam? No, uh, only up until uh, only up till the tenth canto, the, the first part of the tenth canto, the Prabhupada's um, commentary. I've read the, all of that. Okay, well, I've read the whole Bhagavatam because I read, I read the later ones too. Because there's there's many, of course, there's many fascinating things in in the tenth, eleventh, and twelfth canto. Yeah. But I didn't, I didn't read all the purports, and especially the purports that are by other persons besides Prabhupada. Pushta Krishna, he started to read the Srimad Bhagavatam in his lectures. We, he was having Saturday lectures here. Mm. 
So I think it's, I think the Bhagavatam is very, very interesting. And it would be nice to read it. But I would be inclined to read the verses and not necessarily <coughs> all the purports. Because I remember when I was in ISKCON, the general practice was that somebody would read one verse and then speak about that verse uh, ad, what do you call it, ad, well, ad something. I don't want to say ad, I don't want to say anything critical, so I'm trying to think of the proper Latin word, you know. Uh, anyway, I'll drop the ad part because only <laughs> thing that comes to word, comes to mind is a word that. Well, it's not very nice, but not very nice as far as Latin words go. But, but uh, you know, somebody would read a verse, say there were 50 verses in the chapter, they'd read one verse and speak for an, for an hour about that one verse. And then the next day they'd go on to the next verse. And then Practically nobody could remember what the sequence of the Srimad Bhagavatam was. Because it, if it takes you, if it takes you two months to finish a chapter, you know, a verse a day, by the time you get to the end, you don't even remember what was happening in the chapter practically. So I kind of chose to continue with the sequence of the Leela rather than all the commentaries. But I think, I, I think that left... I think that's not acceptable. So if I was going to be reading the Srimad Bhagavatam to the devotees, I would probably want to read the whole verses. But some of the some of the explanations of a verse go on Thank you very much. twenty pages or more. Who's Bhagavan? Oh Bhagavan? I just came from outside late. Thunderbat will be working, so I just came late today. Thunderbat. So, Subhasini, how are you? Thunderbat's Maharaj, yes, I'm I'm very well, Maharaj, yeah. I was reading and the, well, I see so many people, so many of the devotees like Mo, Krishna Mohini, Devashish, Saraswati, they all have this virus. And I was reading in the, actually, when I read the news, I don't read the American news. Well, I do read the news for America, but I read it in the Reuters. And Reuters is based in London, but it was reporting about how, how I think they said one out of every 15 people who get tested, one out of every 15 persons test positive in, in the UK now, I guess, for COVID. Like there's a big, pers big number of persons in the UK. And in the, Right now in the United States, they say one million persons a day are getting this. So anyway, I, I read about London and it seems like it, from the percentages of the devotees, it seems like there is really a problem going on, right? Yeah, pretty much everyone has it now, or has had it. Yeah. In the beginning, Saraswati was one of the first to have it, and then gone all around, and she's got it a second time. Anyway, <clears throat> you know, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, hey, Gorachandra, did you ever get this disease? 
COVID. Yeah. I really don't know, Maharaj. I should have it, really, by by default. Everybody's getting it. Uh, but uh, we have made many tests and we never got positive. But I mean, no symptoms. Yeah, we have, yeah, no symptoms either. But uh, I don't know, maybe I got a very soft version of it. I don't know. I know you probably wouldn't know if you had it. Did you ever get sick, Ananda Govinda? No, not really. I have the two jobs and the booster, and I hope I don't catch it. Okay. All right. Anyway, I was talking about the Srimad Bhagavatam. How in the Chaitanya Charitamrita it says, in one sense it says, I remember in Prabhupada's introduction, he says, everything that's being, the, oh, he says the Chaitanya Charitamrita is, is he describes it as like the, the Srimad Bhagavatam is, is percolated. He uses the word percolation or percolated when coffee goes through the process of percolating, it becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. So apparently the discussion, the presentation of the Srimad Bhagavatam in the Chaitanya Charitamrita takes the essence of the Srimad Bhagavatam and it's percolated to become stronger in the conclusions, more well, more succinct, more succinct and then it's presented in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. So in one sense, by reading the Chaitanya Charitamrita, one is able to glean or, or get, you know, what information is there in the, in the, mm -hmm in the Srimad Bhagavatam by reading the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Now, I've, I've read, I've read the, I've read the Srimad Bhagavatam pretty much like they said from start to finish and also all the, all the purports because when we were reading it, we just read it like a book. We didn't skip, skip anything. We, we read all the purports, everything that was there. And sometimes when there were commentaries by the disciples of Srila Prabhupada, some of their, I mean, we read everything, but sometimes we were a little dismissive about, about the purports that they wrote because sometimes they seemed imitative, what's the word, imitative of what Srila Prabhupada wrote. Like praising some of the devotees for doing this and doing that in the purports, just as sometimes Srila Prabhupada did that, but it seemed a little bit patron, patronizing a little bit when somebody did that about their own god brothers in the, in the purports, like, like they had the spiritual vision to, to uh, comment about everybody's seva, and I thought, I thought, well, perhaps a little dismissively, I thought, who are you to, who are you really to be able to analyze and present, present other save if they're on, if they're on the level of, so to speak, your equals. But of course, they weren't recognized as being equals because they were just merely God brothers. But anyway, that's a little of my own sarcasm there. But I have read all the purports of the Bhagavatam from all of Prabhupada's purports <laughs> and all the purports of the 10th, 11th, 12th canto, which weren't writ written by Prabhupada. But you know, those the 10th, 10th, 11th, and 12th canto, they're fascinating. If you read those, even you can say, well, they're not by Srila Prabhupada, yes, but they're still, the, those, those, those cantos, the 10th, 11th, 12th canto, they're fascinating. Now, you might have got, you might have got the 10th canto already drawn the essence and in a sense read the purports because many people read the Krishna book and the Krishna book is actually a, com is actually a commentary on the 10th canto, the Krishna book. It's presenting the 10th canto. 
But the 11th and 12th canto, I mean, what's in the, I'm trying to think. The 11th canto is really so nice. I'm trying to remember it. I remember. Where is the Abadu? Where is the, the Abadu learning about the different gurus, uh, Maharaj? Yes. Is that in the 11th canto or is that in the 7th canto? I haven't read it, so I will not know, but I always found that that uh, his, that story super interesting, how he would learn from different gurus. And I, I think it's on the latest, but I, I will not know. Yeah, you're probably right. I, yeah, I, I believe that's in the 11th canto. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's really fascinating. It really is about different gurus. The, the honey thief. Yeah, and I guess the story, I believe the story of Pingala must, Pingala, I think that's in the 11th canto. Let me check. Let's see. Yeah, the story of Pingala is in the uh, 11th canto, ch eighth chapter. Oh, what's going on here? <laughs> That's that's very fascinating because you come up with a you come <clears throat> up with this philosophy that that um, disappointment leads to the greatest happiness. Because because you can think of that in connection even with uh, Raghunath Das Goswami, because Raghunath Das Goswami, um, he's lived in the he's lived in the, a rich family for so long, and then he goes to uh, goes to be with Mahaprabhu and Puri. He's put under the care of Swarup Damodar, and his father had sent these. Um, Brahmins to help take care of uh, help take care of Raghunath because they're thinking, oh, he he must be getting skinny. He must be underfed. He's not being taken care of properly. So his father sends over Brahmins and Brahmin cooks and Brahmins with money to stay there and take and to just kind of nurture Raghunath Das, but Raghunath Das doesn't want it, that and he sends the Brahmins are sent back to Bengal except for except that he keeps two Brahmins I, I guess there too so that he can invite Mahaprabhu every month to come to his house or where he's staying and and he's feeding Mahaprabhu and then, then he decides this isn't really pleasing to Mahaprabhu anyway, and he sends those Brahmins away. And then Mahaprabhu becomes very interested, and he has, he's asking, yes, the Swarup um what's, he says, oh, uh, Raghunath isn't inviting me any over anymore to eat, and then then he's told, yes, Raghunath was thinking this really wasn't pleasing to you. And he was thinking that, and then there's the explanation of how uh, food offered by a materialist or makes the mind wicked. And what's interesting about that also, Govinda Maharaj <clears throat> say, you know, so when we used to travel in Bengal and we'd collect rice and collect potatoes and things like that, we we wouldn't take we wouldn't take food cooked by anybody 
but we'd take food that was cooked by a, and that was during the time of Guru Mahar, so we'd only cut, take food that was cooked by somebody who was a disciple of Guru Mahar, but they could be from some other branch of the Gaudiya Mutt, and we wouldn't take their food, but only that was made by Guru Mahar. And then, and we always knew of this verse that eating food cooked by a, by a materialist makes the mind wicked. So it was, when we heard from Srila Govinda Maharaj about, you know, when you're traveling, buying food, he said you could buy food, everything except rice. Rice had too much, too much pop or too much sin connected with it to, to just be buying rice. But I mean, it was just the degree of the different foodstuffs. But when I when we asked. Well, if cooking food, if eating co food cooked by a non-devotee, if that's making the mind wicked, how can you, if you're in a tra traveling, traveling and you, there's no devotees around or no one to cook, then you can, then sometimes the devotees would take from a restaurant, or as they would call it in Bengal, they would call it, a Vaishnav hotel. A Vaishnav hotel doesn't mean where people stay. A Vaishnav hotel is a restaurant where they serve. It's called a Vaishnav hotel because they serve vegetarian food. And we said, "What? Well, but what? How can that be okay? If fr get, taking food from a restaurant?" And and Srila Govindamar said, "Because you're paying for it, and when you pay for it." When you pay for it, that kind of erases the karma attached to it because you're actually paying for it. You're not just getting something. I don't know how that works. Can, does that, anyone know the explanation? But anyway, I was told, do you know the explanation, Devashish? Well, only that, you know, one cancels out the other, so to say, you know, so it's more of a, you know, I suppose like fueling. Yeah, it's not like you're not eating it, you're paying for it or something. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So except for rice, I was told don't don't push your luck with the rice. Rice rice got, carries more karma attached to it than other foods. And the, and they were even given a different degree of which foods were a safer one to to, to eat. And I think surprisingly maybe the safer ones were the 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 fried food was safe. Anyway, but not the rice. Anyway, <coughs> so then Raghunath wasn't offering food anymore to Mahaprabhu, and Mahaprabhu inquired, what's going on with him? And he says, oh, he's standing outside the Simidwar, outside the Lion Gate at the temple, and he's begging from people who leave the temple. And then after a while, Mahaprabhu gets another report that Raghunath is not doing that anymore because he was thinking, thinking that to do so is like the work of a prostitute because, the pros because then one starts to think in a very partisan way, oh, here comes this man, he gave me money last, he gave me money last, yesterday no he's walking by me but here comes another man he he'll he helped me before and surely he'll help me now but he's why oh he's walking by but here then Mahaprabhu said that kind of thinking is the thinking of a prostitute oh there's this man he came to me like you know before and all that so I was thinking of that in relationship with a it's interesting because then we get hear about the story of Pingala the prostitute, and her conclusion is is rather you know it's rather I thought it was rather strange, but it makes perfect sense. But Govinda Marsh once told me he says I am never hopeless, I am always hopeful. But the 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 moral of Pingala, she says, hopelessness is the greatest happiness. She says, hopelessness is the greatest happiness. So you can think, how is that possible? But you understand it. She's a prostitute, so 
she would be out working and looking for, you know, clients and very hopeful that she could earn a living. But then if she got, she's out, out you know, into the night looking for people and then she doesn't get any person, so she becomes hopeless. And then what happens? She goes home and gets a good night's sleep. <laughs> she doesn't have, she doesn't have to work. <laughs> <clears throat> so she expresses the philosophy is that hopelessness or to hope against hope hopelessness is the great hopelessness is the greatest happiness so on a material level on a material level if you become hopeless then that leads to happiness because you've you've worked and worked and worked and you could not achieve any success in your material endeavor. You become hopeless and then you understand, well, there is no satisfaction on the mundane <clears throat> platform. Material platform, I'll never be happy. So hopelessness does lead to the greatest happiness, but you have to see it in the proper context. You can't just think, oh, I'm ho someone who's, who lost all their faith and they become hopeless. Obviously, they're not gonna become happy. It's hopelessness on a mundane platform leads to the greatest happiness. Because you can say like, you've, you've lost the shelter of something that you thought you had, which was completely mundane. And now it's forced you to, to, to you know, connect with something spiritual. So that's the philosophy of Pingala. And I thought, when I read that story and everything, I thought this fascinating. There's a fascinating philosophy. Hopelessness leads to the greatest satisfaction. And I kind of experienced that a little, a little, I said this before, I experienced that a little when I was young because my father was a blue collar worker, more or less my mother. My mother was, a, she tried to also add to the family income because we were poor and she worked as a bookkeeper sometime. That's not blue collar, but my father was blue collar worker and he was in the union and all that. So we were, very, we were poor, poor growing up. And I remember, I'm not going to get too much into this, but just say when it became Christmas time and all my Christian friends, they all received really nice things like, Buy, buy like nice bicycles and special things and got you know treated very nicely on christmas and the kind of presents we would get would be like paris socks one day <laughs> a pair of, a, a new pair of jeans a exactly. new pair of jeans one day you know it's like when you're young, you don't get excited about clothes, especially, <laughs> especially a new pair of jeans are all unlike the jeans today that come pre, I don't, don't understand that people buy jeans with holes in it, holes in them, and they pay <laughs> three times more. I think that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life, practically, to see all these people pay so much money to buy jeans with holes in them it's like dumb if we had the jeans and they got that much holes in them we'd throw them out or cut off the legs and use them as shorts you know but anyway i think i think part of that started even in russia because uh the devotees used to be able to sell jeans in russia and i was told that the people liked it if the jeans were more worn be more used than new. So I don't know if that's true. But anyway, what is this saying? So all the time on Christmas, I'd be getting a pair of, pair of pants or some socks or something, you know, something totally uninteresting to me. I mean, if you're young, you're, you're more interested in getting like a <coughs> trains that go on tracks and make smoke and stuff like that or bicycle, you know, like a nice bicycle. That That's more interesting. But we get some clothes and it was like, uh, how, 
how dull. But then we developed a, a little bit of the Pingala philosophy that after Christmas, the people would say, well, we did this and we did that and we did this and we did that and we ate this and we ate that. And then and I always, I'd always think, yeah, well, that happened already and now it's already happened and now, now it's after Christmas and you're just like me. You've already enjoyed all those things and they're all over. You've, you've already enjoyed that and now it's all gone and it's finished and you're just like me. And I didn't get any of those things and I don't have to lament about losing them or them breaking or anything. So just a, that Pingala philosophy gave me a little satisfaction. I didn't have to get, I didn't have to get envious in one sense of my Christian friend because a couple of weeks after Christmas, they were the same as me. <laughs> Never got, who didn't get those things. Anyway, so I like that Pingala philosophy. Then in the 11th canto, all these other kinds of gurus is interesting too. What is it? The, the honey thief. There are nice explanations how these different gurus. That's where the story of Pingala comes up, isn't it? About the, they're talking about these are different grooves for me. And one is the honey thief, one's the prostitute and all that. Which, which is interesting. And then you read in the, you read that there are also prostitutes in Dwarka. And some of them were very good devotees. But they wouldn't have made it in, they wouldn't have made it previously because they would have been accused of illicit sex. But maybe you could say, well, it's not illicit sex because people are paying for it. <laughs> you know, if you could eat food and it wouldn't be sinful to eat it if it paid for it, then maybe, maybe, uh, maybe prostitutes wouldn't be Ill illegal either because people are paying for it. Do you think that's true? Sounds like a dangerous philosophy to me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you could just say that people who who gave illicit sex for free were more sinful than those who pay, made you made people pay for it. I don't know. Anyway, we won't get we won't go down that street, so to speak. It might be <coughs> it might be a cul-de-sac, right? Maharaj, will it be possible to relate that philosophy of uh, hope and uh, hopelessness um, as a way to happiness? Uh... Your sound is gone. Uh, uh, sorry, that you um, will it be possible to relate this uh, philosophy of Pingala uh, with a uh, few days ago you were. Uh, relating about Draupadi, when she was being uh, abused in, in front of Turjodana and she will hold onto, onto her robes. And then finally, when she let her go, then Krishna protect her. Like, uh, I, I, I'm, just really, I'm just thinking that. Uh, yeah, um, but she didn't, I, my understand, but my understanding, she didn't become, she didn't become hopeless. She just came to the conclusion that that nothing, no, but no one, I cannot, by my own strength, I cannot accomplish anything. So I, my only hope is to surrender to Krishna. It may be a little bit related, but I think it's different than Pingala's philosophy because Pingala just became hopeless and then she had, then she went home and went to sleep. Whereas with Draupadi, she, she, it's like in the Prapana Jivanamrita, Srila Guru Mahar says that two ways that you can uh, take shelter of the Lord. One is to understand that apart from Krishna, I have no other shelter. And then it says the second one is to have lost the previous shelter that you had. Then you could come to Krishna's shelter. So the previous shelter that you m might have had 
could be anything. It could be your family, it could be your boss, it could be your country or whatever. But then when you realize that ultimately that wasn't a real shelter, how could you realize that? Well, maybe your shelter was your family and then then maybe somebody lost their family. Maybe maybe their their wife or husband passed away and then they realized that you know, I mean, they do they, they do say to you, at least I don't know, in, in this country they say, uh, till death do you part. That's part of the ma marriage vows, right? Mm -hmm. the, pre the priest says till, you know, uh, do you know the whole line? Anyone know the whole line? They say, blah, 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 till death do you part. Does anyone know what the blah, blah, blah is? <laughs> What is that? Well, it's something that Richard in in sickness oh, yeah. and in health and in richness and in poorness and yeah, yeah, yeah. happiness and distress, whatever yeah. it is. And as happiness. long as we both shall live. Yeah, and happiness and distress, meaning sometimes you'll be happy and sometimes your partner will make you miserable. <laughs> <laughs> happiness and <laughs> Happiness and health, heaven and hell, all these things. I till till, but then they do give you an, a, 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 what is it? A, an escape, escape clause. <laughs> yeah, they say, till death do you part. Now some people, some people may take that literally, and then they wind up in jail. <laughs> Like apparently, your what was it, George the Third? Was it George the Third that took that literally? Well, I'm sure he wasn't the only one. Well, he he had to start his own church because Henry the Eighth. What? Henry the Eighth. Oh yeah, he had to start his own church. Henry VIII started. Yeah, because there was no divorce in the Catholic Church, right? Yes. Therefore, he kind of till death. He took that till death do you part? Do you <laughs> do ye part literally? Right. Indeed. And and then was. But I heard. Don't they sing some song? Uh, Henry the Eighth. I am. I am. I'm Henry the Eighth. Yeah. Yes, man. What's that about? That that's uh, it's just a a cheerful Cockney song, isn't it? You know, I've been married. Um, uh, he's been married seven times before, and everyone was an Henry. So Henry oh, the Eighth, I am. It's not about actually Henry the Eighth. It said. Um, she's been married seven times before, and everyone was an Henry. So I'm marrying her now. So Henry the Eighth, I am. Oh, kind of a cheerful song. <laughs> yeah. It's not. He's just saying that she's been married seven times before, so he's putting the blame on. We see that. <laughs> You see that she, then she's more or less like Henrietta the Eighth. Anyway, I'm just saying that what you're saying that, oh, the story of um, you were saying helplessness is the greatest happiness and you were comparing it to, what were you comparing it to, Gore Chandra, you said? Uh -huh, Draupadi. Draupadi, yeah. No, she wasn't hopeless. She just, she just understood that she was too weak to fight against what's his name, Dusha Sana. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she understood. <laughs> she understood correctly that this guy is a strong man, and I'm, I'm just trying to hold, keep him from tearing all my claw, all my all my clothes off me to see me naked, then I don't, I'm not going to be able to 
to feed him. So then she put her hands in the air and depended on Krishna. But she wasn't hopeless. She was, she was completely hopeful that Krishna would give her all protection. She just exhausted the previous recourse that she had. Anyway, well, there's Subhadra. Little Subhadra and Sham Sundari. Oh, you have no sound. None of it. Still no sound. Hello. Uh. Maybe that doesn't. Maybe that doesn't have sound. Oh, there. Now try. No. Still no sound, Shamsun. No hay sonido. No sé qué pasa allí, porque no hay, no tiene la el dibujo que. No, no, it's Maharaj. Can you hear us now? Hey, yeah. Now I can hear you. Now I can't. I could hear you for a minute, but now not. No sound. No hay sonido. Ahora? Ahora sí. ¿Qué, qué pasó? Porque se viene y se va el sonido. Sí, es que tenía audífonos y no estaba funcionando el speaker. Oh. <coughs> okay. Están ahí en Madrid. Sí, todavía. Todavía. ¿Sí? Como tú piensas que va a llegar un día cuando no estás ahí. <laughs> no, ni idea. No lo creo. Por ahora estamos acá, pero nos encantaría ir a visitar el templo. Quizás el año que viene. Eh, bueno, ya empezó este año. Este año. Ojalá en las vacaciones. ¿Y no tienen deseos de, de ir a Venezuela? No. Para nada. Por ahora no. Nos gustaría ir a visitar el templo y los devotos, pero no para vivir por ahora. Uh. Uh. Ella es grande, ¿no? Sí, está más grande. Y pesada también, ¿no? Ah. Well. Lavanya, Lavanya Moyi, what are you cooking? Parsnip and potato soup and chapatis. Right. Right. Parsnip and potato soup with cauliflower, actually, and uh, some nutmeg and ginger and uh, some chapatis. Just so you're making, you're going to distribute soup? No, no, this is for the devotees here tonight. Okay. okay. And when, but I thought, but I don't you also go distribute? Yeah, but not in the evenings. Not in what? the evenings. We do Tuesdays and Saturdays at lunchtime. Oh, Tuesdays and Saturday. Oh. We were doing Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, but it was just it, ne it never stopped, and we didn't have time to have, do anything else. So we we took the Thursday away, and just uh, Tuesday and Saturday, and that fits in without it being just like the whole center of everything. So, yeah, when we give the, the when we give the meals to the families or people in their homes, they get two meals, so they have for two days. So they got four days covered. 
How do they have four days covered? Well, we give them two meals, meals for two days, twice a week. So they get two meals on Tuesday and two meals on Saturday. So okay. that's four meals. Yeah, so Govinda Marsh told us that we could give out and we would distribute prasadam to people. But he also said he didn't want the prasadam mixed with meat, that people wouldn't eat mix the meat, but I didn't know how. How can you possibly avoid that? If I mean, if people are eating meat and then they get prasadam, then they're gonna eat meat with their prasadam. So I don't know any way of avoiding that. You can't, can't really just, can't just tell people this, this is vegetarian. You can only eat it by yourself. Well, apparently, Dev Shishu said, Dev Shishu said, Gurda said not to, not to look that way, not to look at it that way. Otherwise, yeah, basically, we never give anything out. But, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Something, you're doing something, isn't it? Something's better than nothing. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Definitely. I used to... In my, what would you call it, my vagabond days, I used to get free food given to me. And I was very happy to get that. So yes, Steve Jobs always thanked the devotees for uh, giving him free food when he was in university. And many people joined the mission because they liked the food. So by distributing prasadam, I think eventually some people are going to join because of that. I feel like for sure, for sure, somebody, some people are going to join because they like very much. And even even if that doesn't happen, a lot of people, they remember the, remember, a lot of people say when, even politicians and and people with position like Bill Gates or something like that, rich people, they say, oh yeah, when I was young, I used to go like to eat at the Hare Krishna temple. They've said that. And sometimes, Sometimes we've gotten actually gotten some fairly big anonymous donations. Like it just some news will come, not not exactly like the millionaire where they used to give. I am authorized by an anonymous donor to give you a this one million pound donation. You know, from this it wasn't that big, but I mean sometimes it would be would be rather big donations, like somebody anonymously would give you, give us like $25,000. That's, a, you know, 15,000 pounds anonymous, anonymous donation. That's pretty big donation, right? Yeah. 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 And who knows where it's coming from or why, but I think people have some people really <coughs> People remember that the devotees fed them. And I remember in those days, I used to think the prasadam, I used to think the prasadam was so great. I mean, everything, the prasadam was so nice. <clears throat> When I was in Hamburg Temple, they every day they would serve rice dal or rice dal and sometimes kitri, but it would be I guess it was mostly kitri and then with with cooked cabbage. But everything had so much ghee on it. It was very tasty. Okay, 
Any other questions beside Gaur Chandra? That answered your question, kind of. Now it's, this has proved to be too much here. Somebody gave me, someone gave me this and I'm not supposed to take sweets. My doctor told me not to take sweets. And this says, say moi, chocolatier francais. Francais? Chocolatier francais. And these are in this box. <laughs> They're chocolate truffles. Just the perfect gift for somebody who's diabetic. <laughs> <coughs> now today is nice and sunny here this is the first sunny day in about two weeks yeah, they're um, they're predicting snow in some places here now. Well, it, every every day was raining. Yeah. Wasn't even getting enough sunlight to charge a solar watch. Rasa Raj, como esta? How is the how is the weather in New York? Raining every day, and uh, this morning, the um, water in the highways were frozen. My my wife called me that she went to her mom's house and she was just going the steps down and she fell because it was frozen and some ice frozen in the in the steps. And my son went to work. I said they closed the, also the, the school because they were like highways. They have accident for for the same the same issue. No, it's raining and it, it's too cold. Delayed twenty three degrees or something like that. Yeah, I I went to school in Boston. I I didn't really didn't like it there because it would snow and then the temperature would go up a little bit and it would melt. And then it would go back down and freeze. And instead of being snow, it now turned to ice. And it was impossible. I thought it was impossible to walk on sidewalks, which were just covered with ice. How could you walk on that? Do, is, do in, in London or, or in New York, is there any way of walking on ice successfully? <laughs> You... Not really, no. <clears throat> Put salt on it, isn't it? That's the only way. You're using salt. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, now it's today. It's nice and sunny here, and for almost two weeks, it was raining every day. What's that? Let's just see the moon. What's it say there? Mm -hmm. One degree. One that's, degree? Yeah, that's what it's now here. One degree centigrade or Fahrenheit? No, centigrade. Oh, nice. Yeah. And tonight it's going to go below. It's going like minus three or something like that. Yeah, minus four. You might as well move to the Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing I, when I was, I don't know, I haven't been to the Ukraine, but the one thing I was 
saw in Russia when it was very, very cold. Inside, it was very hot and nice. They had these radiators that they used and they kept them up very high. <laughs> anyway, so I think it's almost time to sign out. Any other questions? Do no questions from anonymous. Hey, Tunga Rasa. Tunga Rasa. Yes, uh, yes, Maharaj. How are things there in your nice, where you are? Is it nice and sunny? <laughs> oh, yesterday, yes. Yesterday it was a sunny day. In Norway. Today, I haven't been uh, outside today, so. <laughs> And what city are you living in? Uh, south of Norway, Ragero. <laughs> it is between, uh, yeah, maybe 200 kilometers from Oslo. OK. And from the capital. And what, how, how cold does it get there? Uh, maybe uh, plus 5 uh, Celsius. Plus 5. Yeah, about this uh, temperature. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not so cold right now. And how is it in <coughs> Ukraine, J Krishna Chaitanya? <coughs> how cold is it there? Uh, it's also about uh, plus five degrees now, and it's raining. Um, two days ago, it was a blizzard and minus three. <laughs> And again, in a, in a couple of days, it's going to be minus three or minus five. It's always like you described uh, Boston. It's uh, often, uh, often slippery. Everything turns uh, to ice. And they, uh, they, uh, they will uh, spread sand with salt to prevent... Uh, you know, to, to prevent slippery uh, surfaces. Yeah, that was the thing I. That was the thing I disliked most was slipping and falling down on the ice. But the cold, at least the cold didn't bother me so much because I've had on had a warm coat and warm hat, and warm shoes and everything, so not so bad. But the falling down was annoying. <laughs> okay. In Ireland, Subasini, is it is it very cold? Yes, Maharaj, it's very cold here now. Right now, it's it's. They say tonight is uh, like one degree. <laughs> uh, one degree C centigrade. Yeah. Yeah, that's what Gora Chandra showed me. It was. Also, one degree there yes. in London. Yeah, it's, it's been very cold in the last couple of days now. Actually. Well, at night, at night here, it goes down to maybe three degrees, four degrees, five degrees, like that. Yeah, okay. I come out and there's, there's sometimes there's ice on the wind windshields of the cars. Yeah. yeah. Maharaj, I have one last question if that is possible. Um, might be a little bit repetitive, um, but it would be good to have some guidance from you how to be in your daily life um, to be compassionate to everyone. So Vindamar said that when I remember how to tolerant Srila Guru Maharaj with, was with me, then I became become more compassionate with other people. And I can remember that in my not just from my guru Dave, you know, I my 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 guru was my gurus, I've had more than one guru, 
My gurus are always very compassionate with me. But I also think back and I remember my father and my mother, how tolerant they were with me. I was completely horrible. I mean, really horrible. I was very horrible. You know, my brother and myself were really like terrible. And my father and mother, how much they tolerated from us. So not just my gurus. I mean, people have been tolerant of me my whole life. So I have to think that I have to, I have to remember to be tolerant with other people because, you know, I've been, I've, you know, had gotten so much tolerance and I've been so horrible at times with other people and everything like that. And yet they were t very tolerant with me. And I'm, I, I really believe that it, it, it makes one, it can change your outlook towards other people because thinking about how you were or I think how I am, how I was, it makes me very sad. It makes me very sad that I was so unconscious and so, you know, not, and yet I got so much mercy from other persons. So then that makes me think that I have to, I, I'm indebted. I have to give some of that mercy back to other people. You know, and I try to remember that. And I can also say that in one sense, it's been very hard for me in my life to think that I actually have enemies. I don't really, generally, I don't think of people as my enemy. I mean, if I, even if I don't like them or something, okay, then, but maybe I don't like them, but I don't think of them as my enemies just generally it's just kind of like something of my nature but i do remember how horrible i was and how mean sometime i was to other people so then i have to bring i have to develop some tolerance because all, all my life people have been tolerant with me it requires something i mean if you think of it in terms of you're indebted i'm you're all in, we're all indebted to our guru. You know, our guru Dave didn't have to do this for us. He was not under some contract that he had to do this. That was his job or his obligation. He did so out of the kindness of his own heart. So we have to develop some of that. It's, now you can say it's payback time. It's time to give some of that back to other people. You know, that's the way I think about it. If I had to philosophize it, but I'm, I'm not really conscious of that. I'm just my, most of the time, I'm just my usual snotty self. <laughs> but I try to, I, if I have to think about it, that's what I'm conscious of. And besides, you know, now that we're, now that we're calling ourselves devotees, we have to be representative of our Guru Maharaj. You know, if, if, we, act, if we act terribly, then it will cast ba bad fame on our mission and upon our Guru. And we don't want that. I don't want, my, I don't want people to think, oh, their Guru must have been a real, real, really terrible because that person is so terrible. No, we're also representatives of our guru. We have to be able to, you know, develop Vaishnav qualities because we're representing our guru. Other people see that, see it that way. If people have to complain about you, they'll complain about your guru. You know, you can't, we can't allow that. I was, I was broadcasting this morning, I was broadcasting the Chaitanya Bhagwat class and someone asked me, why, why do you keep the camera so far back? Why don't you have it closer? And I said, because to have it closer, I would have to put the, have to put the tripod in front of Gurudev's Vyasasan and how, we have a Vyasasan for Govinda Mars here. It just happened to develop. I know they don't have it in other temples. But then I said, I, 
if I had to put the tripod closer, I would be blocking Gurudev's line of sight. How can I do that? How can I put a tripod in front of where my guru is sitting and then he's going to be seeing the deities and instead he's going to be, his vision's going to be blocked by a tripod. So he said, no, I have to keep it far back because a little further back because I can't block Gurudev's vision with a tripod. So I'm, I'm, I mean, what can I say? I become, I become totally brainwashed. You know, I become totally brainwashed, and this is the way I think. Like, like some Hare Krishna. <laughs> you you have to be compassionate, otherwise people will think your guru is not compassionate. Was your was your guru compassionate? Was Gurudev compassionate? Yes, my Yeah, well, then I guess we're obligated to be compassionate too, because if we're not, people will think, oh, their guru was must have been like that too. I think it's a it's a mistaken logic. It's called what are they? What's the mistaken logic where you think if the source is bad, then what comes from it is bad? It's actually a mistaken logic, but it's the way people think. They call, they call that genetic fallacy. They call it. I think it's in logic. It's called genetic fallacy. Isn't that right? Is it? Does anyone know? It's one of the mistakes in logic. Genetic fallacy. It's just wrong way of thinking. If you think, oh, this person's this person comes from a bad family, therefore this person must be bad. No, it's not true. That's genetic fallacy. But it's the way people think. If they see that you're bad, they'll think your guru is bad. It's a mistaken logic. It's like that they, they but they always do it. They say, Oh, you you can't take the you can't take the testimony of this person because this person's a drunkard. Yeah, he may be a drunkard, but a drunkard cannot cannot comment. If he sees a crime, he can't believe what a drunkard says. No, it's a mistaken logic. But anyway, that's another thing. But people will think that we're, if, if we act improperly, they'll think our guru didn't trip. They, <laughs> They, maybe at best they must think they might think oh their guru didn't pr train them po properly therefore i've developed some different thinking for instance this may be uh, this is also dumb on my part but i used to i always liked drinking i always liked drinking tea and i and Govinda Maharaj would offer us tea and everything. But then some people th criticize us for drinking tea. And I think, well, I'm not going to let these people criticize the mission or something just because I drink tea. So then I'll stop drinking tea. Because then, then if they say anything, oh, you... You people drink tea, and I'll say, uh, I'll say, I'll say, who are you talking about? I don't drink tea, so go away, you a hole. <laughs> I'll take away one of their arguments for criticism. <laughs> but if Govinda Maharaj was still here, I would, I would. Gladly drink tea with him, but now I become a goody goody. What do they call it? A goody two shoes. Do they have that expression? Yeah. All right. Anyway, end of the rope, end of the line. 
Here we are again. Literally, oh, what's so nice about Green Street is it's literally, isn't it one stop before Barking? Yeah, Upton Park. As Aston Park means one stop before Barking, literally, right? Yeah. Just like the expression, right? Yeah. What did they, how's the expression go? He was completely Upton Park. He's completely up in park means he's one, he's one stop, stop away from barking. Barking, meaning completely insane. Yeah. <laughs> and we literally live at the place they joke about. <laughs> he's very, you don't, you live, but Green Street is literally there, right? Yeah, that's the, that's the train station in Green Street, Upton Park. Yeah. And... The funny thing, I when I when I I saw a lot of the lot of the people in that I won't deal with any religious slurs or anything, but I'll just say I did see a lot of the people in that area were kind of somewhat nuts. Yeah, they throw eggs at the door and stuff like that. So anyway. <laughs> what I liked is one time, one time some people tried to attack uh, Nitai and also who else was it? Nitai and and Virachandra. They tried to attack them, and then some of the people from the, the football. Uh, who would go to the stadium. That was the stadium of West Ham. Yeah. Some people, some of the, some of the people from the uh, stadium, the same people who used to sit on the steps of Green Street and eat unmentionable sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> they, they protected the devotees from, from being attacked. And I thought, then I thought very well, very, I thought very nicely of those people. Hey, those people are kind of nice. Even if they sit on our steps and eat, eat meat sandwiches, still they're nice to the devotees. Uh, everything can be seen in a favorable light, huh? Yeah, that's right. Did you know about that? Yeah, I heard about that, yeah. Anyway, I'm happy to see all of you. I did. Yes, ma'am. I did yesterday. I got my passport back. Huh. Okay. So my Dandavat Pranams, time for... Time for Thank dinner. you very much for your time and attention, man. Thank you. 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 Thank Hope we cross the line. I hope we cross the line from from mundane prajalpa to transcendental. Well, I can't say transcendental prajalpa. Atyahara, atyahara prayasas cha prajalpa niyamagraha. All right, my dandava. Dandava.